Welcome to the Inequality Virus Press Conference at the Davos Agenda. I'm joined today for our first and only press conference of the day by Gabriela Boucher, Executive Director at Oxfam International, da um, Rebecca Marmot, Chief Sustainability Officer at Unilever, Derek Hamilton, Professor of Economics and Urban Policy at the New School, and last but not least, by Pilato, musician, artist, and activist. Before we get started on our press conference, I'd like to do a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, please, if you have any questions, please use the chat feature. We'll be collecting the questions um, and then giving them to our panelists after the their little engagement, and then we'll need for those questions your name, your organization, and where you're dialing from. Um, so let's get started. Gabriella, today um, Oxfam International released a very dramatic report on the status of inequality and the impact that the pandemic has had. Can you share with us some of the conclusions and findings of that report? Thanks, Alim. And so we're here united by one common goal, to fight inequality. 2021 must be the year we see governments wake up to address the inequality crisis. And people want change. Just before COVID, we saw powerful protests in countries across the globe against inequality. And now this week again. And this course is changing. Global bodies from the IMF to the UN are prioritizing the issue of inequality. Professor Schwab of the WEF wants the world to move on from neoliberalism. We've seen New York Times commentators to activists in Davos even talk about abolishing billionaires. And it's not just them wanting change. So it's kids who've seen their parents die when healthcare is a privilege for the rich. It's nurses who demand safety and decent pay more than applause. The pandemic has made clear, we should value nurses more than we do billionaires. So what's our data saying? First, we risk facing the greatest rise in inequality since records began. Secondly, it could take more than a decade for billions of the poorest people to recover from the economic hit of the pandemic. While at the very top, as if they're living on a different planet, just 10 billionaires, all men, have seen their wealth skyrocket by half a trillion dollars since March. Our report also details the profound impact of systemic racism and patriarchy. Nearly 22,000 Black and Hispanic people in the U.S. would still be alive if their COVID-19 mortality rates were the same as white people. Think of the families who can't hold their loved ones because leaders refuse to address inequality. Our simple ask is for governments to explicitly commit to equality and to get working on it, to make it their goal to end extreme inequality and abolish gender and racial inequality altogether. More specifically, I'm at Davos in this virtual way to push for a people's vaccine so we can all get a jab against the virus, not just the richest countries and people, which is what's happening. We need universal health care, as middle-income countries like Costa Rica have achieved. We need to tax the richest, as Argentina is doing. Invest in the fight against gender-based violence as Canada is. We want every company to be taking the kinds of steps Unilever is across its supply chain and more. Pursuing equality is the moral thing to do, but the pandemic teaches us that it's also common sense 21st century economics. So I ask, if not now, when? Thank you, Gabriela. Um, Rebecca, uh, Gabriela mentioned the work that Unilever is doing and the major announcement that you made um, last week. Can you share a little bit of what Unilever does to tackle this inequality issue, but also what the role of the private sector is in addressing this issue? Thanks, Salam, and yeah, evening, everybody. Uh, congratulations, Gabriela and Oxfam, on a, on a great report. I think in addition to the pandemic, we've all seen over this past year, the two other main issues at the top of everyone's agenda are, are climate change and, and social inequity. And I think what the Oxfam report's done today is highlight the importance of tackling it across all sectors. They've dealt very well in the report um, around this first issue with the takeout being that there are key structural and systemic inequalities 
in the world that have sadly been further accentuated by COVID. So in response to your second part of the question, Alem, on what's the role of the private sector, I think it's really clear we need to reshape society and economy so that there is a new model that brings longer term prosperity for everybody. So I guess a new normal. And I think from a Unilever perspective, what we look at is how companies can take that responsibility and adopt it right the way across their full value chain. So really try and address social inequality in a much more collaborative way. So just a, a, a couple of, of examples you asked me about some commitments that we made last week. What we've tried to do is to set out a very holistic approach to helping to bring about a more equitable world in four key stages. So the first part is about getting our own house in order. The second part is about what we can do across our entire value chain. So from the farmers uh, and the sourcing of our crops and commodities, all the way through our value chain and our manufacturing, uh, through to our retailers and out then to our consumers and our customers around the world. The third part is through our brand. So how can we use the power of big brands like Ben & Jerry's to have and encourage better social positive impact? And then lastly, about working to drive systems level change. So working with others on advocacy, partnership, industry collaborations. So we identify three key areas where we can believe we believe will make a big difference. The first is around raising living standards. So enabling millions of people in our value chain to achieve a decent standard of living. The second is around creating opportunities through inclusivity. So thinking about how do we eliminate barriers, help to create new opportunities for excluded and unserved populations to engage with our business. And the third around preparing people for the future of work. And then underneath that, we've got eight very specific commitments. So including things like a living wage or living income to everybody who is directly providing goods and services to Unilever by 2030. So really thinking about how do we focus on the most vulnerable workers in agriculture, equitable work culture. So thinking about how do we achieve a much more equitable culture through progressive policies and practices, really eliminating bias and discrimination. For example, this morning we announced that we're joining the WEF's uh, Partnering for Racial Justice in Business Coalition. That's working across workplaces with 48 others. Things like supplier diversity, spending 2 billion annually, 2 billion euros annually with diverse businesses by 2025. Skills for young people, helping equip 10 million young people with essential skills to prepare them for jobs by 2030. So a whole host of different things. I've touched on a few of them there, but I hope during the panel we get a chance to discuss some of the others. Thank you. Um, Derek, you've, well, you've had a, quite an influential voice on uh, in the US and with many politicians backing your ideas. Can you give us a little bit of um, what role the public sector can play, but also specifically to this new administration that just went into the office. What can they do to make sure that inequality is still at the top of the agenda? I mean, we certainly have to deal with the urgency of this pandemic, the economic and health crisis. But beyond that, you know, we need to move and transition towards economic rights. I think realized or not, the civil and political aspects of human rights have been ingrained in our public psyche, but at least as important are economic rights. The right to assembly and choice, they're limited for individuals that lack basic needs like a job, income, shelter, food, and health care. Of course, the globe, as your report uh, more than adequately highlights, um, throughout history, in extreme inequality has persisted and in plain sight, racism, sexism, and other isms are strategically used to consolidate economic and political power. Of course, that's unjust, it's immoral, and it's all about power relationships. And this pandemic reveals the collective public and economic vulnerability, but it also reveals a system that actively produces inequality with race as a focal point. Obviously, that's immoral. We have black, brown, and poor families that began this with low wealth and adequate health care, working in precarious but essential jobs with few workplace protections, lower wages, and lower benefits. Um, we can say with certainty that if we don't act, that this inequality 
will only uh, manifest even more in the aftermath of, of this pandemic, particularly with regards to race, gender, and, and ethnicity. But that is unless government acts to change that reality. And that's another key point, that this is not inevitable, that there are things that we can actually do to change this react reality. At issue has been government complicity in generating, facilitating that extreme economic and political inequality described in the report. Increment, incrementalism and changes on the margins, they're not going to cut it. In order to reverse those decades of poverty, discrimination, and economic and political concentration, we're going to need a bold overhaul of our laws and our economy. We can continue down this path of deregulation, lower taxes on the wealthy, gutting of government services under the guise that this is going to generate a market dynacism that's supposed to trickle down to all, all of us, or we can make a profound change towards a more sustainable and moral economy with government interventions to facilitate the assets, economic security, civic engagement, human dignity, and social mobility for all its people, regardless of their race, class, gender, sexual orientation, or their gender status. We need a new industrial policy that centers workers, that centers people, both domestically and abroad, coupled with explicitly anti-racist and anti-sexist economic rights in order to promote a fair economy grounded in our shared prosperity. In other words, we should reject the empirically unsubstantiated rhetoric that centers inequality and deficit behaviors or ignorance and recognize that there are indeed resources that people need in order to have flourishing and authentic agency and choice in their lives. Commit to justice as a matter of faith. Don't let the timeliness of what we perceive can and cannot, we can and cannot achieve constrain us. In other words, commit to our prosperity and recognize that it is ultimately our economy, our government, and our monetary systems in order to fund economies and government to do great things for people. Thank you. Um, Pilato, you've, well, last year we saw um, the power and the impact of grassroots organization and your music and activism reached millions of people. Um, how can we ensure that that dynamism that we saw um, really is used to enact real change and um, isn't dispersed as we move on to the next issue? Uh, first of all, we must understand that music has so much power, so much power that it has, it can influence, it can shape the direction of a society. So music has so much power that it can be understood even by the less literate, the less educated still do understand music. And the most educated will still understand and appreciate music. So music has so much power that it can influence across uh, social uh, classes of people. So it is this music, it is this power that music has, that that is that, that we use to bring people together and influence them towards a specific cause, and in this case, a specific cause uh, which is inequality. So we use this power to bring people together. What should be done is, and what should be understood is that, even as we discuss inequality as as a concept. It is the people, it's the grassroots people that understand, that live, that experience inequality. Inequality is not a political issue. Inequality is a humanity issue. It, this is an issue, this is the reality that so many of our people live, live with. And involving them, putting them together, making them understand, allowing their voices to be heard, allowing their concerns to be heard, is the most effective way of getting to the root is getting to the solution of inequality. I am a, I am a member of the Fight Inequality Alliance, which is a global movement working to address and fighting inequality ac across across the globe. And what we've learned through through time over time is that there is no way we can find a solution to a problem we do not understand. As we address issues like inequality, the the first step is do, how much do we understand this problem? And there's no better group of people that understand inequality than the people themselves that experience, that live in, at the forefront of, 
uh, inequality. So the grassroots are the key in addressing a lot of these issues and especially inequality. And music brings them together. Music with its power delivers a message and empowers those that are less empowered. It empowers the, the weak in our society. So grassroots are the solutions. Grassroots has a solution to what we are grappling with, and that is inequality today. So music brings them together, and music gives them that power and platform to express themselves and be allowed to be, to be heard by people from across uh, social classes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, wonderful statements, and... Uh... So thank you so much for sharing. I'm going to open up the Q&A. So if uh, anyone wants to ask questions to my panelists, please put it in the chat feature, add your name, your organization, and also where you're dialing in. We have quite a diversity of dialing in. We have two people from the UK. Um, I'm myself in New York, so is Derek. And Pilat O is dialing in from uh, Zambia. So I look forward to see who's uh, joined us today. Um, but in the meantime, I also want to open up the opportunity for my panelists to ask questions um, to each other. You guys have uh, shared, you know, Rebecca shared what um, Unilever is doing, Derek, what are the public policy that needs to be enacted, Pilato, the power of uh, the grassroots, the people who are living this inequality day in, day out. And uh, Gabriela, if, um, I will start with you. Um, you said, um, you know, you shared some really some striking findings. What surprised you the most? Uh, I know for the first time, um, Oxfam is also looking at race as another dimension and the intersectionality of inequality and race. Uh, I'd be really fascinated to hear your thoughts. Thank you, yes. Um, I think, yes, I wanted to go back to what Pilato was saying also. So the, those people who experienced inequality in their daily lives are, are those who most know about it and we need to ask them and, and, and they're part of the solution. And at the same time, there is somehow a, a perception that is, is too complex, that it's a system that is beyond ourselves and, and somehow a certain inevitability, so a sort of thinking that it's, it's something that we're somehow destined to live in. And, and Derek was also referring to that. And, and we, I think what we need to do is unpack and definitely say it is a choice. And there are historical reasons why um, certain um, groups are marginalized, have been marginalized, and that we need to address these historical reasons and uh, compensate in such a way that we create um, a, a more level playing field. So not to accept that these things have been the way they they are and they should continue, but they really need to change. And I think the pandemic has exposed this in a more extreme way. But as, as I think we've all said from different angles, the situation was already extremely unequal. And this is why the pandemic is again hitting in such unequal ways. So it, we, we need to somehow come out of this vicious cycle of, of inequality and find their policies that can be implemented and there are plenty of examples from countries that are doing it, businesses that are doing it like Unilever was just sharing and also people movements that strongly believe as, as Pilato was explaining. So th there's from different perspectives, there's that conviction. We need to bring the pieces of the puzzle together to really achieve this transformational systemic change that uh, Derek was talking about. So it's Sometimes from depending on what the angle that you're looking at it, it looks too complex, but we can also break it down into concrete elements. And I think one that we have been talking about this this week and that is very clear in the report is that we measure rather than we, we are all measuring in countries and in and businesses is measuring sort of on the side of, of figures. So GDP is an obsession, uh, economic growth. So what does it mean really if, if a country is growing, one country may be growing at the same rate of another, but if there, it is much more unequal, then all that growth is going in the hands of a very few people. If in another country it's very distributed, then we actually more people are benefiting and, and the difference is, is much greater. So if we focus more on what is happening with the people themselves and focus on well-being and also sustainability measures, then we are measuring the things that we really want to impact. So I think it starts with that. How do we measure what matters and then introduce policies that make us achieve those goals? 
Derek, I can see you nodding a lot. <laughs> Do you want to add? Yeah, I mean, I love the intersection of my co-panelists and, and what's been said. And, you know, the way Gabrielle just finished with talking about measurements, measurements are values. So what we define, how we define our economic well-being in terms of how we measure it also defines our values. So what do we want to center? I mean, do we want to center people in their, in their capacities to thrive and, thir- and uh, flourish? I mean, that is our most treasured resource, people. So investments in people, in my view, should be central in how we de- identify economic well-being. And then the other point I, I just want to make quickly is, you know, some clear themes that, that I observe from what everybody says are, um, you know, catchword intersection. Well, the intersections of everything that's been discussed and the inseparability, I think, is critical. So understanding that art is inseparable from economics, is inseparable separable from race, is inseparable from political economy, that from politics, that they all link together towards uh, propelling systems. But, you know, and that may seem complicated and nuanced, but at the root of it is basic rights. At the root of it is the ability to have housing, the ability to have uh, a decent income. And these are things that we can facilitate. And through art, for example, we express narrative. We can define whether people are deserving or undeserving based on something of their their gender or race. Through art, we can define um, what a moral economy looks like. So that, that's the point about them being inseparable. To think that we can, and I know I'm talking a lot, I'm going to stop in a second, to think that we can isolate economic well-being from political well-being is a misnomer. There's no such things as, as markets being natural. They're political constructions. And to think that we can think about politics in isolation from the power that corporations can be, bring to de- defining politics, that's a misnomer. And then likewise, we run the risk of being vulnerable to despotic authoritarian leadership if we don't recognize the ways in which race, gender, immigration status can be weaponized in our society to pit one group versus the other in order to offer horizontal positioning in exchange for vertical positioning in an immoral way. It's critical for us to understand these intersections. I agree. Uh, we definitely cannot separate any of these things. And I think we're realizing um, the fallacy uh, of trying to attempt it. Um, I have one more minute uh, before I have to close out this press conference, which feels um, very short because I feel like we're just starting to get to, to the root of it. Um, but um, what I will do is invite uh, the participants on this press conference um, who are attending um, to read Oxfam's International's Inequality Report. It's a fascinating read. Um, I think it will surprise people. Um, but I also want to thank everyone for joining us today. And I want to th- especially thank my panelists uh, for making the time and really um, providing their voice to addressing and uh, tackling inequality. So thank you, everyone.